Good afternoon. I'm Sean Spicer with the Republican National Committee. Welcome to day two of the GOP at the DNC. Uh, we certainly enjoyed our first day. Uh, it seems that the Democrats continue to struggle with the ability to answer the basic question, are Americans better off after four years of President Obama? Uh, today we have got an impressive lineup of surrogates. Governor Nikki Haley of South Carolina, Governor John, former Governor John Sununu of New Hampshire, Congressman Tim Scott of South Carolina, Congressman Jason Chaffetz of Utah, and Yovita Carranza, who is uh, the former Deputy Administrator of the Small Business Administration and a current resident of Chicago, Illinois, conveniently. Um, for those of you who, uh, who missed yesterday, I uh, just want to make sure on the way out, you know that we've got, we, we wouldn't have you come all the way here without a little something. We've got Obama's of working swag bags. Uh, they consist of some Legos so that you can build it back in your hotel room. Um, we've got some Kleenex to help uh, get some of these folks that are breaking up with Obama. And then uh, you might be interested in, we do have a copy of uh, Obama's second term agenda. Uh, you'll be interested in the pages. Um, before we get started, uh, I just want to make sure you know tonight, as things kick off with the formal uh, presentation of speakers, our website, Obama Isn't Working, will chronicle all the speeches, the facts, and figures. Please uh, feel free to check it out. It'll be updated in real time to make sure that we get the facts and the distortions and the excuses and blame that we'll, you'll hear coming out of Time Time Warner Arena. Uh, before we get started, as we did yesterday, I just want to show you videos. These will go live uh, sometime at the end of this press conference, so you're getting a sneak peek. <coughs> in a lot of people's minds, and that is, are we better off today than we were four years ago? Absolutely. The middle class is coming back. There's so many people who simply don't think they're better off than they were four years ago. How do you convince them that they are? Well, I don't think they're better off than they were four years ago. economic recovery America has ever had. One more quick one, because we love you. Tonight I want to have an unpleasant talk with you about a problem that's unprecedented in our history. With every passing month, our energy problems have grown worse. We still have serious problems. Our trade deficit is too large. And too many Americans still do not have a job. Lately, federal spending has taken a steadily increasing portion of what Americans produce. The federal deficit is too high. Our people are simply sick and tired of wasteful federal spending. For the first time in the history of our country, a majority of our people believe that the next five years will be worse than the past five years. We are at a turning point in our history. Without further ado, Governor Nikki Haley. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. I can tell you that I do appreciate the DNC coming to Charlotte because this is what it's all about. It's all about the debate. It's all about what's going to happen in November and what we want. What I can tell you that we know we don't want is four more years of what we have. They have always said, if you keep doing what you've always been doing, you're gonna keep getting what you've always done. <coughs> and what we know now is that if you compare where we are four years ago, unemployment is higher. The debt is higher. The median income is lower. People don't have as much in their wallets as they used to. Gas prices almost double. If you ask your average household just your average, average household, your average mom, they're going to tell you, we all know someone who's lost a job. We all have seen that we have less in our wallets than when we started. We all know that we are worried about the debt that our children are taking on. And we all know that something has to give. What I love about America is that we have ability to self-correct. What I am astonished by is that this president has admitted it for himself. When you ask him what grade he would give himself, he said an incomplete. I have a 10-year-old and a 14-year-old. I know if on their report card they came home with an incomplete, that means they fail, unless there is summer school. There is no summer school. So he has basically said, I didn't get the job done. 
It is time for real courage in our country. I'm not worried about the people of the United States because I know that they're going to say we deserve better. It's like the two independents I talked about last week in Michigan. They said, we're just learning about Governor Romney, and we know we don't know everything yet. But what we do know is right here, right now, we deserve better than what we have. And that's what we're facing with. This secondary war on women, I expect under 60 days of total distractions. Distractions about anything and everything to keep from talking about their record. Let me tell you about women. Women are extremely smart. Women are extremely bright. We don't only think about contraception. We think about a lot more than contraception. I know pro-life women that are in the Democratic Party. I know pro-choice women that are in the Republican Party. But I also know that all women care about their budgets. They care about their jobs. They care about the economy. They care about whether they're going to be able to pay for their children to go to school. They care about whether their children are going to move back home or actually have a job when they get out. They care about regular things that deal with jobs and the economy. It is insulting to say a woman only cares about contraception or a woman only cares about pro-life, pro-choice issues. That is not the case. It's insulting for this president to admit that that's the case. It's insulting for Reverend Jesse Jackson to say that he can't believe that Governor Nikki Haley is talking about voter ID. Because who is it to say that minorities are the only people that don't know how to get an ID? We know how to get an ID, just like we know how to do everything else. Every distraction they've put on has been insulting to the public. The public is smarter than this. What I can tell you is the public is going to go to that ballot box, and they are going to look at their wallets, and they're going to look at their families, and they're going to look at their jobs, and they're going to say, are we better than we were four years ago, or do we deserve better? <coughs> I think they're going to say, do we deserve better, and the country will start to self-correct. Thank you. I'm just sorry that uh, our latest surrogate, President Carter, couldn't make it in here himself, but at least you saw the uh, video. Uh, I think President Obama wished he had at least the same performance as, as President Carter. The interesting thing about that video is how amazingly it parallels the disaster of the last four years. I'd like to touch on two points. I, I was rather pleasantly surprised at the honest evaluation that, that started this weekend when, when the Democrats were asked that question, uh, are you better off than you were four years ago? Uh, Governor O'Malley said no uh, until he got Cory Booker back into Pinocchio land and, uh, and uh, then uh, changed his story to uh, make the president uh, a little bit happier. But the fact is, is he was right the first time. We are not better off. Uh, the latest trend on that, if you listen to the Democrats, is they're trying to say, well, we, we, we agree that most people uh, in America, most of the folks in America that haven't got jobs and those that are hurt by the 8.3% unemployment and the 23 million unemployed and underemployed aren't better off and all the small businessmen that are scared to death aren't better off, but the country as a whole is better off. How can the country as a whole be better off with $16 trillion worth of debt. Uh, there is no one uh, in the whole world that would say we are better off if we are on the verge of the same kind of fiscal disaster as the Europeans are seeing. But I'd like to touch on, on the second question that was asked this weekend. Uh, when the president was asked what, he, what grade he would give himself, he obviously had a quick look at his report card and saw a big eye on it. Uh, he thought the I was for incomplete. The I was for incompetent. But let me grant him incomplete and talk a little about that. I used to teach at Tufts University, and every once in a while, students would come in and ask for an incomplete. It was the students that failed to meet their responsibility. It was the students that failed to do what they were required to do in the position they were in. It was the students that didn't understand the challenge that they had been given. It was the students that really couldn't cut it. And you know what? Most of the students that asked for incompletes, you knew that no matter how long you gave them, if you gave them another chance, they still wouldn't be able to do it. And you know, that applies to the president. The president gave himself an incomplete because he didn't do the job. He had two years with a Democratic Congress, and he diddled around with Obamacare that 60% of Americans say is terrible. 
And in the last two years, what has he done? He's gone to 205 fundraisers. He's campaigned incessantly. He's played 15 rounds of golf, and he's failed to meet once in the last seven months with his jobs council. This is a president that really was right, in a sense, when he said he deserved an incomplete. But the fact is, not only did he not do it and deserve an incomplete, he really doesn't deserve a second term either. It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Congressman Tom Scott from South Carolina, that, uh, uh, who will give you, I think, uh, the perspective of the kinds of problems we have in this region. Thank you, Governor. Uh, listening to your comments reminds me of my time in school as well. Uh, I understand that incomplete is a way of avoiding a failing grade. And as a freshman in high school, <clears throat> I flunked out. I failed world geography, civics, Spanish, and English. When you fail Spanish and English, they don't call you bilingual, by the way. <laughs> they call you bilingual because you can't speak any language. And, and when you're in that situation, you really want something that looks like an incomplete grade. But unfortunately, what you get if people are actually grading you is a failing grade. Our president, when asked the question, are we better off, gets a failing grade. And let me tell you why. Four years ago, the unemployment rate in the black community was at 10.7%. Today, it's almost 40% higher at 14.1%. You think about it, at the inauguration day, our debt was a little bit less than $11 trillion. Today, it is projected to hit $16 trillion. Foreclosures are absolutely higher. Hope is absolutely lower. And that is why I've been consistently saying that the hope for America is to change the resident in the White House. We need Governor Mitt Romney because he understands, like my mentor did, how to create jobs in the private sector. The fact of the matter is that my failing grades became success when I had the opportunity to meet a mentor who understood how to create jobs in the private sector, and he taught me the valuable lesson that having a job, Tim, would be a good thing but creating jobs is better. He taught me that having a vision for job creation is one of the ways that we transform our communities. Today, more than ever, we need someone who believes and has a vision for America in the same fashion that my mentor had for me. We need someone who stirs up our own self-confidence, who requires us to believe in our future, because he does. We need President Mitt Romney. Thank you. I'm uh, Jason Chaffetz, a congressman from Utah's uh, 3rd Congressional District. And, and one, of the, one of the speakers on the agenda tonight is uh, Harry Reid. Uh, I find that interesting. Uh, let me give you a little perspective. If you were to spend a million dollars a day, every day, it would take you almost 3,000 years to get to one trillion. Four years in a row, we've had trillion plus dollar deficits. We now have a 16 trillion dollar debt. Now we're paying more than $600 million a day in interest on that debt. We deficit spend in excess of $3 billion a day, money that we don't have, that we have, to, we have to go out and borrow. This is not sustainable. What it requires is some adult leadership that is able to put together a budget and put us on a trajectory to actually meet the needs of the nation. Now, I believe there is a proper role of government, but we have to debate and discuss that. The way the framers set up their constitution Yes, we have a House, we have a Senate, we have a presidency. But when you have two of those people that aren't engaged in the process, it falls down and it breaks apart. I can look everybody in the eye and say, look, for the last two years, Paul Ryan is the budget chairman. We have produced a budget and, and passed a budget. Yet the United States Senate has gone more than 1,200 days in not producing a budget. And when you look to President Obama, he will look you in the eye and look right in the camera as he did in the television commercial and say that he wants to pay down the debt. Well, you can't pay down the debt unless you actually produce a balanced budget. Four years running, the president has introduced a budget that never balances. Nobody expects it to balance in year one, but you expect it to balance at some point. Never once did he produce a budget that would actually balance. In fact, one of the consequences is when it went to the United States Senate, I believe it was two years ago or last year, it was defeated, I believe, 97 to nothing. The president's budget was voted on this, this year. It was defeated 99 to nothing. How bad is your budget if, if Chuck Schumer won't even vote for it? 
There is not a single Democrat who has ever supported the president's budget. And yet he wants to lean forward. He wants to continue on. We deserve better. We need somebody who understands economics, who understands finance, who understands business. That's why I support Mitt Romney. That's why I support Paul Ryan. They have demonstrated they can be adults in the room and understand the finances of this country and put us on a trajectory to get the, our fiscal house in order. So anytime you hear that word, they want to pay, the, pay down the debt or cut the debt, you got to ask yourself when you hear that over the next three days, does anybody have a plan on the Democrat side to actually balance the budget? Because thus far, they've never, ever asked for that. Thank you. I'm going to introduce myself in Spanish, so um, if you're going to take notes, this will be a little awkward. Buenas tardes, una Latina y ex directora de la Administración de Empresas Pequeñas. Quiero tomar un momento para hablar de historia rascada, rascado del presidente Obama con respecto de las mujeres y los hispanos y sus ataques inaceptables contra las pequeñas empresas. You know, I took uh, inventory of the number of um, statistics that have just been quoted by many of the former speakers. And when you think of the general public, uh, the Latinos, uh, they know the numbers too. And they know them well because they have been um, uh, significantly impacted. You know, uh, President Obama has been a great disappointment to the Hispanic community. The 2.3 million Hispanics that now find themselves in poverty, um, they know the numbers well. The, the high cost, not only in education, but healthcare and um, gasoline, they know that uh, when the, before Obama took office, it was less than $2, and now it's, uh, in some states, close to $5. So they fully understand, we fully understand the um, impact that the current administration has had on the economy of the Hispanic community. It's been a total disappointment. It's been catastrophic for many. Um, as you know, the last one's in, the first one's out. So unemployment has been extremely high. Um, Take-home pay has been reduced significantly by thousands. Uh, with regards to um, the overall women, who are uh, the greatest number of small business entrepreneurs that are starting business, they've been impacted negatively as well with the current ec uh, economic situation. One, they will avoid employing, uh, bringing on new employees. Why? Because they have uh, concerns about the cost of the Obamacare, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, or just health care premiums. Secondly, the cost of energy. Um, I know small business owners that own trucking companies that are looking at this time to either be acquired or sell. Why? Because they cannot afford their equipment, the leases, and the purchase of, of fuel to maintain their businesses. You see, we strive for the American dream. But when the American dream has been hampered significantly by Econo the economics based on the overall um, educational system and the taxation reform, which is slow in, in coming, um, we, as the um, largest growing demographic, we being the Hispanic, uh, largest growing demographic, uh, is negatively impacted. We look for hope, we look for change, and all we have found is total disappointment. Governor Romney is very much aligned to what we aspire as uh, entrepreneurs. We aspire for growth, we aspire for expansion, we aspire for continuity, quality, and uh, based on his five plan that's going to touch on the economy, the energy, the education, tax reform, and also trade. It aligns with the philosophy of the conservative uh, Hispanic community. More importantly, it aligns with the 25 million small businesses that the um, U.S. administration, Small Business Administration represents. You know, at a hotel that I'm staying at um, here in Charlotte, wonderful hotel, the front desk receptionist uh, is a business owner. It's a woman, business owner. She owns a cleaning pool business. 
She does that during the day and works at the hotel at night to supplement her income. She says she wants to uh, live the American dream and expand her one employee and one pool that she services to 100. But she's very cautious at this given time. Why? Because the economic environment does not perpetuate, does not fuel her growth at this given time. So I say, what we need is an immediate change. Uh, we can do better if you choose Governor Romney and uh, also Paul Ryan to lead us to that change and definitely to fulfill the American dream. Thank you. I think we're gonna have, we have time for a few questions, uh, so just tell me uh, who you'd like to direct your question to. And uh, yes, sir. Can you state your name and your organization for the governor? Sure. Sean Drury, Governor, as a military wife, um, I know this is an important issue to you, but during Governor Romney's uh, second speech, he didn't mention the military. Um, can, you, can you give me your thoughts on that? Yes, because I've had a personal conversation with him on the military. It was one of the first issues I talked about when I was vetting the primary candidates. What he has said many times on his stump speech is that he will never apologize for America that he will always have the backs of our military. And I will tell you as a military wife, as a military sister, there has never been a time where military families feel more insecure than we do right now. Because when you have a president who slashes the budgets of defense, knowing that we're sending our husbands and our brothers and our sisters and our mothers, all of those people out in harm's way to sacrifice for the freedoms that we have for a president not to have their back, what does that say about America? No matter what happens, when you look at government intended to secure the rights and freedoms of the people, there is nothing more at its core than its military. When you have a president that has let down its military and continuing to say, we're going to cut, and that's where we're going to cut, you have a group of military men and women that literally are walking out there thinking they have a dartboard on their back. That's a terrible way to go. Our families watching it happen, my husband will go just like every other military family, but it sure would be a lot better if we had a president that had their back so that they knew they were going to come back safe. With all the question on that issue that's been flying around, it's important for people to understand that just the day before, Governor Romney addressed the American Legion in great detail on, on his recognition of the need to make sure that we don't cut the defense budget on his support for the military, on the need to rebuild the Navy and the Air Force, and on the foreign policy issues, including questions associated with uh, Afghanistan and other areas where we are. So there is a very detailed presentation right in proximity with what the governor did say in Tampa. A quick admin note before we continue. Governor Haley had an appointment. She'll be actually back tomorrow. There's a sneak peek at tomorrow. So if you were dying to ask her a question, that's incentive to come back a little. Um, Next question. John, in the back. Yes, sir. We're uh, down here to uh, Matt Weller here with Southern Gossip Group in Raleigh. Why in a battleground state such as North Carolina, how do you think local candidates are going to have to deal with that? Uh, what you're going to see is a campaign of candidates. Uh, this is Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan against the failed presidency of President Obama and, and Joe Biden. That's what people will see at the top, and each individual candidate at the congressional level, the Senate level, across the board will define themselves on the issues that they think that their particular districts feel are most important. Candidates are the most important part of a campaign, and we have uh, in Governor Romney the right candidate at the right time to fix America. Based a similar kind of election, his economy was actually starting to percolate going to go along. Are there lessons from that election and his defeat? Yeah, the biggest, the biggest lesson is make sure Ross Perot doesn't run against me. <laughs> but let's talk about where this election is. 70% uh, of Americans today say they are not better off. 40% of Americans today say this president does not deserve to be reelected. The kids have gone back to school with through Labor Day. A great chunk of America that, frankly, for the best of reasons, because they struggle with their jobs and their family, has not paid attention to this campaign until now. They're going to pay attention now. And they're going to wake up and realize that either they or their kids or their grandkids or their parents 
have no jobs, they, or, or they have a college graduate that's unemployed, or, or they have uh, had four years that have interrupted their life planning. And I think uh, as they start paying attention to that, you're going to see the uh, lead that Governor Rodney now has grow larger and larger. It's what I call we're in the ooze season. Uh, President Obama's numbers will ooze down, and Governor Romney's well, our numbers will ooze up, and America will do the right thing on November 6th. Yes, sir. Amy Sullivan from the 9-11 Hot Hats. Uh, folks, this is to anyone up there. I'm probably the most quintessential blue-collar, middle-class guy here, I'm assuming. And my, I'm here on my own time, on my own dime. I came down here because I am tired of the rhetoric and the platitudes. And... My big question is this, do you realize all the support that you guys have within the blue collar community right now at this time? And we feel like we're being abandoned, like no one is extending an olive branch out to that group because immediately you think union, you think Democrat. And let me tell you something, the rank and file is 60 to 70% with you guys, but they just need a sign. It's only the leadership that is these blind drones that are just listening to this Obama stuff. It's because we know you're there that I am confident this is going to be a good election. If you need a sign, here's the sign. There's one guy who understands that private sector unions are, are really a part of the process as long as they, they, they don't oh, get the temptation to overreach. And there are some difficulties with what the NLRB did to Governor Haley's state, or tried to do to her state. Okay, we understand that, but we do also understand that, that uh, there are great ways uh, for the business side and the labor side to work well. When I was governor, I had what I still think is the largest union job in America going on in my state at Seabrook Power Plant. And, and we ended up with a great relationship with the blue collar side of America. They are the backbone of what makes this country efficient and work well. And sometimes there are conflicts, if you will, on the high policy level when folks in Washington, like President Obama, try and cut very special deals with the hierarchy that likes to sit in the White House and have coffee, tea, or perhaps the new flavor of beer that the President is making. But we need you folks. We understand that you are the backbone of this country, that you create the efficiency in our manufacturing jobs, that the relationships should be better, and that every once in a while things get off track when, when a stacked NLRB goes in the wrong direction. But I appreciate you being here. Governor Romney appreciates you being here. And please send the message back. It will be better, and it will be better because you will help us make it better. Thank you. Yes, sir. David Webb with Sirius XM Patriot. I have a question for the governor as a follow-up to that. When it comes to the Scott Walker effect, where a lot of private sector union members went out and voted for Governor Walker, is there some effort to have an outreach campaign all across the country? Uh, there is. Uh, there, there is an effort to outreach across the board. There is particularly an effort to, to try and keep the dialogue hard and alive and, and, and really vibrant in places like Ohio and Michigan where, where there is a lot of blue collar unions that, that historically have done the right thing. Uh, it was the backbone of Ronald Reagan's victory where the heartland America uh, blue collar folks that understand we needed a change at that time. So there is an aggressive effort, I think, taking place on a state by state basis uh, in order to do that. Uh, frankly, one of the things that has made it difficult uh, is some of the hot rhetoric in the campaigns. And, and I've sat down with a couple of folks that are involved on the labor side uh, up in New Hampshire. They came up to visit to talk about the very issue you have raised. And, and uh, as a representative of the Romney campaign, I tried to convey to them that we want very much for them to understand that, that there is no problem at all with the blue collar workers that are members of unions, we just have difficulty with them trying to lock out in many places others who are not. 
And I do believe that there's enough of an understanding that the problem in America is jobs, jobs, jobs across the board, and that everybody benefits when you have an economy that's growing and moving forward. Time for one more question. Yes, sir. I'm Andrew Dunwin of the Spartanburg Herald Journal. Uh, so with this whole thing, uh, the debt, gas prices, the economy, creating jobs, these are all very complicated things. Uh, how, how much does one man, Obama, how much responsibility does he bear? I think when you look at the reality of the presidency, it is one of the strongest positions in the nation as it relates to articulating a vision for the future. Much of what happens is based on momentum and direction. The fact of the matter is when you're sitting in the House and you pass 32 job creating bills that are sitting in the Senate, nothing happens to it. You've got to ask yourself, what role does the White House play with Harry Reid in forming an opinion and a decision that blocks those bills going forward? You think about the Keystone Pipeline and the direction that it could have taken and where we find ourselves now. You look at the energy debate and signing leases, that's a job that the president could do. You look at the opportunity for us to bring people to the table to, to negotiate on avoiding the cuts to the military because of sequestration. The fact of the matter is the House passed it in May of 2012. And the fact is that without avoiding that sequestration, we're looking at another one million lost jobs in the civilian world that support our troops. You're talking about the loss of 200,000 men and women in uniform. That's a major impact that could have been led in a different direction by the White House. We are still hopeful that they will come to the table and be partners in creating an environment that is conducive for creating jobs. The fact of the matter is our unemployment rate for the 43rd, 42nd month in a row is over 8% in large part because our White House refuses to come to the table and participate in turning this economy around. We'll have more tomorrow, and we'll explain to you why a failed presidency has failed America. Thank you. One o'clock tomorrow. Thank you guys for coming.